Alright guys, this is a long play and review of Iridium on the Amstrad CPC. Now this is an interesting one. For many years there hasn't been a long play of the CPC version on YouTube and I've often wondered why. Well now I know. On this long play we're going to encounter some extreme difficulty but worst of all, game breaking bugs which do not fear we will overcome. Now the story of the CPC version of Iridium is also interesting. Iridium was originally released by Hewson for the Commodore 64 in 1986, with the Specky version following very closely, but nothing on the Amstrad, no full price release. Which is odd because, spoiler alert, this is a straight Specky port, and Hewson were releasing full price games on the CPC right from 1984. So in instead, to most people's knowledge, it went straight to its Racket budget label, which we can see the box art here of. But this was in the latter half of 1988, over two years later. Well, I've been doing some digging around, and from what I can find, the first time Iridium appeared on the Amstrad was on the Houston compilation called Four Smash Hits in 1987, uh, which you can see the box art here of advertised as Iridium Plus if you look closely in the bottom right corner. Now Iridium Plus is the same game but with 15 new and different levels which did arrive on the Specky in the Commodore 64. I found a dump of this compilation and tested the CPC version here and it is not Iridium Plus but the original intended Iridium with the same levels of the first game. So a bit of false advertising there. What's further interesting here is if you look closely there is an AA Rave Award in the bottom left corner which is from Amstrad Action Magazine but I cannot find a review in the magazine prior to this compilation so that's a bit fishy but I have been in touch with some Houston contacts to find out what happened to the original CPC version but no info back so far I'm afraid guys if I do eventually hear anything I will pin a comment on this video but anyway, we're going to kick things off now, and uh, we're playing obviously a cracked version of the game. So I'm not going to spend ages loading it from cassette and an emulator, that's daft. And quite a nice loading screen here, yes, yeah. And here's the title screen with an excellent version of Steve Turner's Commodore 64 music by Dave Rogers. He of Zynap, Cybernoid 1 and 2, Deliverance, Nebula, Stormlord, etc. fame. All for Houston. Um, original design and content by Andrew Braybrook. Uh, but the Amstrad version apparently was programmed by Neil Latarche. He also did Airwolf 2, Hoppin' Madden, Metropolis for the CPC. And with a bit of digging, I believe the graphics were done by Stephen J. Crow. He of Firelord, Starquake, and Zynapse fame. But I'm not 100% sure on that. But excellent music here, and we'll hear it in full at the end of the video again as well. And let's kick things off on the first of 15 levels. Okay, and we've got a space set horizontally scrolling shoot em up. Uh, basically, guys, destroy uh, as many waves as possible of enemy fighters, destroy as many of the um, targets on the ground. And when you have destroyed a sufficient number of both, I believe, um, and after a certain uh, amount of time, you'll get a notification in the uh, top middle of the screen in between the scores, telling you that you can now land your uh, spaceship. There you go, land now. And you find the landing strip at the end, and that is the first level done. So let's tell you about the uh, story from the manual. The solar system is under attack. Enemy super dreadnoughts have been placed in orbit around each of the planets. Uh, they are draining mineral resources from the planetary cores for use in their power units. Each super dreadnought seeks out a different uh, metal for its metal converter. Your Manta class space fighter will be transported to each planet in turn and it is your task to destroy each dreadnought. First, he must attack the defensive screen of enemy fighters, but he must neutralize the majority of surface defenses before you land on the, on the Super Dreadnought's master runway. It is then possible to activate the Dreadnought's self destruct mechanism. Uh, your Manta fighter is deployed on a low level strafing run as you start your assault on the alien's defenses. You must avoid the meteor screens 
and communication aerials uh, which tower above the Dreadnought's surface. The fighter defense deploys in waves. A bonus is awarded after landing if all the ships in a wave are destroyed. Attack surface features to score bonus points, but beware of the homing mines which materialize over flashing generator ports. And lastly it says when the land now message appears, move as soon as possible to the right hand uh, end of the super dreadnought and fly flat over the end of the master runway from left to right. And there you go. That's everything in the manual, pretty much. So, right, yeah, so we're trying to destroy as many of the ground um, defences and items as possible. I'm taking our time now on our third on the third level because it's quite um, the difficulty now get ramps really really high up. There's the communication aerials to avoid in the middle there. Enemy fighters on uh, kind of a runway, but that's not a runway you will be landing on. Those are the meteor shields, those big black blocks. Oh, I've now got the land now message. And there's the runway, but we've got a mine deployed on us. Oh, that was really close. And there we go. So each of the uh, planets and dreadnoughts are named after a metal or mineral. We're now on silver. And uh, quite nicely there it changes to like a whitey silvery uh, background. And uh, yeah, um, actually it, according to uh, legend that this is actually, the, the game itself, Iridium, is a misspelling of an actual metal and mineral called Iridium. And the manual has a credit there for a uh, name created by Robert, I thought it really existed, Orchard. So this was probably meant to be called Iridium. And the final planet would be, uh, and Dreadnought would be Iridium. Instead, it's Iridium. Perhaps it's a special metal that you can only find in space. But there are, as I mentioned earlier, there are 15 Dreadnoughts and planets. So 15 levels in total. And I will tell you now that the game basically crashes on level 12 and level 14 if you actually um, test it further than that, if you manage to. But don't worry, we will get to the full end of the game and complete it in full, don't you worry guys. But we will talk about that when we get to it. But as such guys, you can see that this is a um, Zelic Spectrum port, or a Specky port as we like to call it. And, you know, us Amstrad CPC fans get really annoyed by having specky ports thrust upon us all the time by developers back in the day. However, I actually, guys, this is actually a really good specky port. Um, it actually plays or it plays identically to the specky version. And I actually don't see any slowdown compared to the specky one, because often specky ports to the Amstrad... We're going to be we're always going to be slightly slower because it's using specy code and sort of emulating stuff on the spectrum. So it would they tend to be a little to a lot slower than the specy version if it is a specy port. But here, I can't tell the difference in the speed and frame rate. Now talking about other versions, the Commodore 64 is the original one uh, by the famous Andrew Braybrook. And, um, yeah, I mean, it is the best version of the game by an absolute mile. Um, it's, br it's a brilliant little uh, shoot em up. Um, but the Commodore version, it has some additional bits that didn't make it to the Specky and the Commodore and the Amstrad versions. Like, the Manta ship gets deployed from a larger ship at the start of the level. And at the end of the level, you get to test your timing skills with a simple game to get extra points. And after that, we actually get to see a little sequence uh, as your Manta flies off from the Dreadnought with it slowly blowing up underneath it. Feels very much like um, the Death Star blowing up in Return of the Jedi and uh, Lando Carizian flies off with it exploding around him in, in the uh, Millennium Falcon. So a little bit, little bit of Star Wars influence on the Commodore 64 version. But yes, the Commodore version is of course the best version, with re really quite nice graphics for the Commodore 64, I have to admit. Great music and sound effects, very fast and smooth gameplay, and it's probably easier to handle than the Specky and, C and CPC versions. 
that's not to do any disservice to the Specky and Anshad versions. It too played really nice and fast and smooth. Not as fast and smooth as the Commodore 64 version, but this is this is still actually quite impressive stuff. Um, especially on the Amstrad, which often struggled with scrolling and stuff like that. Now the ZX version, ZX Spectrum version, of course, is identical to the CPC one. Just doesn't have quite as good sound effects. Um, what's interesting is in the manual for the Specky version, it actually tells us that the game plays at 17 frames per second, and I presume then it does on the Amstrad too. So this is. Quite possibly, guys, 17 frames per second, 17 FPS, which is actually pretty decent. You don't want to go any lower than that, and that's when you start to... Re oh, some interesting odd sound effects there, which doesn't always play. We don't know if that was because of the land now appearing, or us getting a bonus life, maybe? Which I believe you do after every 10,000 points. I've got a kind of a parallax scroll on the go there, a little bit, with the thick star field in the background behind the Dreadnought as it scrolls. That looks really nice. And I do actually like the graphics. It, yeah, it's, it's, if we ignore that this is a specy port, um, the graphics are actually really nicely detailed mode one graphics in four, in four colours. And it's nice how the colours uh, change between the Dreadnoughts. So I like that very much. I think the sound effects are absolutely first rate as well. I really, really like the uh, sound effects here. The gun sh shooting noises, the alerts as a wave of enemy fighters attack you. The alert there for the homing mine, explosions and all that kind of stuff. And the crashing noise when you do actually crash is really, really nice too. You'll hear that later on in the game, don't worry. Um, and the music was absolutely fantastic on the title screen as well. So really guys, I'm, I, I'm actually impressed by Iridium, and I was as a kid. I thought I didn't get very far in it. The temptation here is to go as fast as possible like that and have fun going, like flying at really fast speeds. But really guys, if you want to do well in Iridium, um, especially on the Amstrad and Specky versions, you got to go quite slowly. And there's about three different speeds that your Manta will go, so it's all about adjusting those speeds. There we go, now got the land now up here. That just appeared randomly, I hadn't shot anything for a while, so maybe it is on a kind of a timer as well, as well as like shooting a certain number of ships and destroying a certain number of ground targets. Hmm. Oh, that was a bit cheeky. The aerials there placed right in front of us at the start of this level. Uh, they're certainly not making it easy for you. I don't think I ever got off like the third Dreadnought as a kid when I had this on the uh, Racket Budget label, which I bought with my pocket money. And I was impressed by it at the time. I just found it too difficult because the temptation is just to go too fast in the game and blast through it. Really, it's more of a measured shoot em up. There's one of the mines about launched on us. Now, I'll say this now, actually, there is actually a, a kind of a glitch or an exploit you can use in this game. I don't know if it's the same on the Specky version or not, but if you're at the top of the screen, right at the very top of the screen, um, I didn't know this when I was actually recording this, but like basically you're invulnerable from enemy shots and mines. Not from the, uh, the ground targets and uh, meteor shields, but if I, stuck, if I stuck at the top there, that mine would not kill me. I only found out this later on after testing the game when we encountered the uh, game-breaking bugs. But you will see me using that technique on the last two or three levels later on in this long play. But for now, I'm playing this pure, I'm not using the exploit <laughs> or glitch. Which does actually show that like, perhaps they didn't play test the Amstrad version very well and rushed it out for the uh, Ball Smash Hits compilation. As we talked about earlier. However, this is actually a really, really good specy port. 
but those mines are a real pain in the backside. They are really the bane of my existence in this game. And there's some certain techniques to try and uh, avoid them once they deploy, because they kind of home in on you. But there's like an uh, there's an inertia on them as well, so you can use that to, to your advantage and watch them slingshot past you if you like slow down right at the right moment and stuff. Now there is a kind of an inertia on your ship as well, so when you turn around, oh look at that! There's a little glitch that happened on the high on the score. Little. Uh, have you spotted that? Well done. <laughs> yes, there's a few little weird little glitches in this game. Hmm. Anyway. Um, so yeah, watch out for inertia on your ship because when you turn around you will actually still move a little bit in the same direction you were going before you start moving off. So you could be turning around but still end up going into the wall that you were trying to avoid. very easy there. Look at that See what I mean guys? Look at this, very difficult. Oh my gosh, that was so close. Nice landing noise there as well. I like that. <laughs> Thing right in front of us at the start of the level there. Yikes. And this is, this is where it gets really, really tough now. So I'm just going to try and destroy as many of these defences as I can before we move on. And taking things very slowly. And I'm always trying to be uh, get behind the wave of fighters as well. If you're in front of them, like, oh, that's... That's very, very risky. That should have been, like, death there. Um, if you're in front of the fighters, of course, they will eventually, like, shoot at you fairly quickly and their bullets come out really, really quickly too. Um, so what I've done here is got behind all these like flying O's <laughs> and taking them out bit by bit. A bit of a glitch there of an explosion. Did you see, did you notice that sprite glitch there? Hmm. Uh, so I'm behind the fighters. Um, and if you have a whole wave of fighters on the screen at the same time and you fly over one of those uh, mine launchers, the mine doesn't tend to deploy, so maybe you want to move over a mine launcher, like there, where you've got a whole wave of fighters. Unfortunately I screwed up there because I wasn't expecting the uh, block in the way there. And look, while we've got a wave of fighters on the screen there guys, the mine doesn't deploy until there's about one or two of them left on the screen. That was a bit risky there. We can land now, just behind this this wall defence. This meteor shield, and there we go. Another level done. Now there were other versions of the game uh, released for the uh, BBC Micro, which is highly regarded. The BBC, BBC Micro uh, version is quite impressive, actually. Nice, colourful graphics. And feels very, very, very similar to the Commodore 64 version. Perhaps like a cut down, simplified version of the C64, but um, many people argue it's a second best to the Commodore 64 with the Specky and Amstrad versions coming in third. On the 8 bits, anyway. Um, the MS DOS actually got um, a port of the game. It has awful beat music and garish CGA graphics. It plays smooth enough but it plays really, really slowly. I mean, really slow. So it's probably the worst version of the game, but it's still decent and playable. Actually, I'm forgetting about another 8-bit version of the game. Um, it was at, this was actually released on the Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES or the NES, however you want to call it. But it was renamed The Last Starfighter, um, released by Mindscape in 1990 as a film license of the same name. Um, so Mindscape often picked up quite a few old and cheap film licenses and then looked for a game they could like rebadge and rebrand to, to roughly match what the movie was. So the NES got The Last Starfighter based on a, an old film from the 80s and the ship sprite was changed to match that of the movie. <gasps> but it's the same game otherwise and look guys the game has crashed! We're on level 12 
And the game has crashed here. Oh my goodness. Now, if you're really quick and move off the start of level 12, it doesn't happen, but then it's, things start to go very, very weird. So we're gonna fast forward on a bit. Look at that mine where it deploys there, just randomly in the middle of the screen. And the game goes absolutely bananas in now, really slowing down. The mine is slightly off from the launcher there. Another one launches there, but I cannot land on the landing there. So even if you manage to get through all the glitches on level 12, you can't actually land at all at the end. And then the game is broken. Nice crashing sound effect there. So guys, I decided to go on the CPC wiki forums, as you can see here, you can find the topic there. And I asked if anyone has ever completed it and does the game crash on later levels, etc. And I've talked about there, like the game goes bananas on level 12 and crashes. Even if I make it to the end, it's impossible to land and complete the level. And then I did some more testing from other dumps of the game and I confirm it is bugged. Uh, yes, it always crashes on level 12. And later on in this forum topic, Nish comes to my rescue. Nish, oh, what a dude. Well, you can always rely on Nish to come with the goods. I found the source of all the bugs. At the beginning of the, each level, the game creates a buffer at address 0400 to store the locations of all the homing mine launchers. However, it isn't large enough to hold this information for levels 12 and 14, and as a result, can't work it out. Where the information, information ends and it will read garbage data as you play level and cause all sorts of interesting bugs. The solution is to move the buffer to another area of memory, such as blah blah blah, and increase its sli size slightly, and the following pokes will do this. And there you go, guys. There is the pokes there to fix the game. And then later on, uh, Nish actually did a full crack of the Iridium that incorporates the fixes and lets you save the high scores to disc two. So if you want a fixed version of the game, guys, it's on the CPC Wiki forums. You, you should easily find the uh, topic. I'll put a link in the description, and I'm sure it will appear on uh, the usual websites. So if you want to do it yourself without using the crack disc, you can enter the pokes here in Win8 Debugger. And just follow what I'm doing here. So press UG press F7 or F8 to get the Win8 Debugger up. Right click in that second window there and use the go to command to go to the addresses Nish has posted there. And there you go, 23BE. And we have to change that to uh, E1. Uh, change that from 04 to 00. zero. It, all, it all makes sense, guys. But um, <laughs> Nish actually released the um, fixed version disc um, after I did this long play. So um, I had to like enter the pokes manually. But I thought I'd show you how to do that, guys. If you ever come across that in the future and some really, really kind person like Nish. I mean, oh my God, guys, what would we do without people like Nish on the Amstrad scene? Um, he's also the CPC Games, uh, Game Reviews website webmaster as well. And he's done his own games and he's fixed tons of games, dumped tons of games as well. And he's come to my rescue on many a time along with some other great people in the scene there. And look, there you go. The game hasn't crashed after the bugs there just to make sure nothing bad happens. And now we can actually get back to um, doing level 12, which we will uh, jump in now with the uh, pokes in place. And look, guys, the game hasn't crashed. Hurrah! So well done, Nish. And like again, guys, what would we do on the Amstrad scene with people like Nish and other people that spend their... Uh, Eat into their like you know their free time, their family time, and work life and personal life. Who spent hours like fixing things like this? Uh, I'm hugely appreciative of it, and we all should be too if you're an Amstrad fan. So thank you, Nish, and thank you everyone else, anyone else who spends their time dumping and fixing these games and helping people like me out. And now we can actually see the full. Um, oh look, the glitch in the score there again happened. We can actually now see the full game of Iridium on the Amstrad, and here it is on YouTube for you all. So thank you, Nish. So I'm using this glitch and exploit here now, guys. At the, so if I stick at the top of the screen there, I can't get hit by enemy bullets and I can't be destroyed by the mine. I only discovered this after extensive playtesting 
and testing niches like pokes and stuff like that. I wish I knew about this at the start of recording this long play, but um, but I've done it without using that glitch all the way through, up to level 12 or 15 anyway. But from this, this level onwards, guys, this is insanely hard. I mean, I'm making this game look easy, but I've had to like record this level by level mostly, um, certainly after the first few levels. Um, to try and do this without uh, losing a life anyway, but um, this game is absolutely rock hard. At least you get bonus lives every, I think it's 10 or 100,000 points. And, and you can see I've, I've racked up quite a few spare lives already anyway. Um, so there we go guys. Oh, that's the end of level 12. Um, coming up, uh, we were talking about other versions of the game. Uh, just quickly, this also arrived on the Atari ST. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much identical to the Commodore 64 version, strangely, but plays slower. My god, so a 16-bit machine playing slower than the 8-bit version. That must have been very confusing for Atari ST owners, especially if they had this game and uh, or had seen it on the Commodore 64. Wow. It just shows what clever tricks that Andrew Braybrook uh, used on the Commodore version of the game to get such a fast and smooth gameplay. Uh, also guys, you may have noticed a few sort of um, sound glitches in the recording of this footage appear um, every now and again briefly. I do apologise for that. There's nothing I can do to fix it and I am certainly not going back and re-recording all the footage of this game. <laughs> Hopefully that is not marring your enjoyment of uh, this long play. Um, so, review scores at the time. So, I can only find, as mentioned earlier, a review of um, Iridium on the Amstrad in Amstrad, Ma Amstrad, bleh, Amstrad Action Magazine in of the uh, budget re uh, release of the game. I was going to say re-release, but it was never actually released at full price, just on that compilation. Um, this was in um, issue 37. October 1988 on page 46 and um, it was a strange review actually because they give, <laughs> they've given the graphics 57% the sound effects 56% grab factor 58% stain power 54% so all in the 50% range for everything but then gave an overall score of 68% I'm like what? If you read the review as well, like for example, sound effects Amstrad Action gave 56%, which is like mad because this is some of the best sound effects I've heard on the Amstrad. And uh, they actually say in the review, a wonderful tune plays on the title screen and the sound effects are pretty good too. But then they give the sound effects 56% and add a little comment saying adequate effects. What were they smoking it in the Amstrad Action offices in those, uh, in that year? Uh, in 1988, I don't know. Some of the reviews were very odd back in the day in Amstrad Action. For me, the best reviews started coming in 89, 1990. Especially when Rod Lawton took over the magazine as editor. Oh dear. Um, but yes, first day target in the Amstrad Action review says, Destroy Free Dreadnoughts. Uh, that's actually quite a good target actually. So I don't think as a kid I actually managed to destroy the third Dreadnought. There we go. So Amstrad actually gave this 68% overall, and I think they're mad. Um, so I'm not agreeing with them on that. If they'd actually got that far in the game and noticed all the bugs, I mean, I would have taken the review score down quite sharply, which I'm going to have to take into account when I give my final score. Now, without the bugs and stuff, I would have probably given this... Um, maybe an eight or eight and a half out of ten but because the game ship with game breaking blogs there's glitches there's exploits and to be honest guys it is overly difficult it really is overly difficult with that in mind i'm going to take my score down to about seven and a half out of ten uh i think with a little bit if 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 they'd fixed all the bugs and glitches and exploits if they and also if they toned down the difficulty somehow um this would be a much higher reviewing game because to be honest guys if you can go this at really fast speeds and stuff you, you want to be going those speeds and having fun 
blasting at high speeds over you know the dreadnoughts and all that kind of stuff and causing mass destruction instead the fun is sucked out of it because of the level design and how tight everything is like here that's insane sure it's one of the uh, one of the last levels in the game it is actually the last le level in the game this is the iridium level level 15 but you have to go so slow and precise it's stressful it does suck the fun out of the game but this game isn't for wimps. It's meant to be a tough game. So, you know, there you go. Swings and roundabouts. Uh, but 7.5 out of 10 from me as a final review score. So here we go, guys. The final level. And this is really tough because we've got two mine launchers there. But thankfully, we've got that exploit we can uh, use. But I was waiting for a wave of fighters. Then I can move across the um, mine launcher. Because the mines don't tend to launch when there's like a full wave of uh, enemy fighters on the screen, that's your chance to go over a mine launcher and get past it if you can. Very nearly died there. I'm just waiting for these guys to go past us, because they always shoot forward in the direction they're going. So if you get behind them, they don't shoot backwards and they use that to your advantage. A very, very tight bit here. God, blimey. I will actually mention as well, actually, guys, um, there's some iffy collision detection at times from enemy ships and their um, lasers or shots at you. I've often thought that, like, maybe there's like an invisible box around your Manta, which actually is maybe a pixel or two above the ma Manta ship. And there has been some instances of some cl dodgy collision detection on the enemy shots. But as for like the meteor shields and the aerials, um, it's pixel perfect. So that's good, but it's a shame that there is some iffy collision detection here and there. And there we go, guys. That is the final level done. And unfortunately, we don't get any kind of completion screen, not even any text, it just immediately loops back to level one. How annoying and disappointing. Oh, look, guys, you can actually turn your ship on the side there. So if you're going full speed, hold down the fire button and push up or down. Your Manta will turn on its side to do some difficult manoeuvres. But you can only actually achieve that if you're going at high speed, so it's mostly useless. So we're going to fast forward here, we're going to kill ourselves, get to the game over in high score screen. And there we go. A really nice music here as well on the high score table. Uh, well, the high school entry, anyway. And to see the high school table after this, you have to wait for the full music to play out. So we're going to listen to the full title screen music again, because it is so good. It's actually quite short. And then we'll end things. So there we go, guys. A, a really, really good, fast-moving, smooth, horizontally scrolling space shoot 'em up um, I really, I, I did enjoy this, although it, it is really, really tough. Uh, some extreme difficulty. This took a lot of work for me to do. Uh, but a big thank you again to Nish for fixing the bugs in the Amstrad version. Much appreciated. And um, I'm glad it, I'm glad I finally uh, done Iridium and it's over and done with, quite frankly. But a great little fun little blaster. Great in, great in short blast, this one. I don't know about you guys though, but I, I kind of enjoy the CPC version of the music more than this, the Commodore version. I don't know. It's one of those rare times that I might actually enjoy the AY chip over the um, SID chip. I don't know, it's personal preference. Swings and roundabouts and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, guys, here's a high score table. That's the last thing to show you in this game, um, which nicely appears and then disappears very, very quickly. So you might miss who, who was at the top of the high score table there. But there we go. So yeah, guys, seven and a half out of 10 for me. Thank you very, very much for watching and I'll see you all again very soon. Goodbye.
So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click a like below, leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already. And over that way, there's another video for you to check out. Zypho, out.